today we're going to be in Romans 5. And I want to talk to you about peace with God. I want to tell you what I think I'm going to like. This is what's on my heart to teach you. And then we're going to pray. And I'm going to try my best to see if we can do that. I think we both have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to preach the word of God to the best of my ability. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. I think you have a responsibility. What's your responsibility tonight? Open your hearts. Turn to the person next to you and say, you got responsibility tonight. You got responsibility. We're doing this. It can't just be on the preacher, right? All right. Okay. All right. Let's say a prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, this is, this, is, this is your church. We're part of a church that you're building all over the world to be your hands and feet, to bring healing to people's hearts, their families, their relationships. And it starts with having peace with you. I don't know who's here tonight that needs to raise their hand and say yes to you and receive you into their life, but I pray, get their heart ready right now. And God, I don't know who needs peace in a relationship, peace in their soul, their mind, but tonight show up with, with shalom, with the power of peace in our, in our hearts by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Help both myself and everybody here to do our jobs as we lean into your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody set? Amen. Amen. All right, okay, here we are. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Um, I want to read it to you. Romans 5, verse 1, it says this. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, uh, let's start that one again, okay? Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God. Say it. Peace with God. Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. I want to pay attention to two things there. One is this. It says, it says therefore, which when you see the therefore, you know like, like what's coming next is like we've been building. We're building up. We're building up. We're building up. Therefore, and then it says, since... Since what? It says, since we've been made right in God's sight. That's past tense. Do you get that? Have been. You are not trying to make yourself right before God. It's something that what? Jesus Christ has done for us. Religion will say do, but the gospel says done. D-O-N-E, done. We're here to celebrate not what we do, what God's done. Everything we do is a response to God. Everything we do is a response to his love for us. Everything, it's about receiving. Have you received Christ into your life? Have you received Christ into your home? Have you received Christ into your soul? Because God has done this for us. We can receive his peace. Now, how many think our world needs some peace? Our world needs some peace. I don't know, do you have a relationship? Do you need a when you think about peace, I know, I, I'll just tell you, recently I didn't experience peace somewhere, and it was driving in California. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of the term California drivers? Yeah. Right? They don't have, like, Kansas drivers. No one's like, you know, like, all oh, those Oregon drivers are so tough, you know, right? I mean, maybe, you know, okay. But California drivers... I actually looked up what's a California driver. And uh, a California driver is this. Is, this is the Urban Dictionary. I don't know if that's as good as Webster's, but okay. People who drive in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, drinking a soda, talking on the cell phone, and going 85 miles per hour. I'm in California, and I'm driving with a friend. Now listen, listen. I'm going to tell a story, okay? We're going to, like, a story that connects to peace and I don't want to throw this person under the bus, so I'm not going to say their name, but I'm in California driving with Dan Sertal. <laughs> and, and I'm driving with them, and, and, and we're on our way back to the airport to come to Seattle. Spoke at a Bible conference. I'm heading to the airport. I'm going to fly back. And so we're heading to the airport, and, and Google Maps said, okay, and how many know when you're, when you're driving with me, you cannot trust my directions? So I, we're leaning into Google Maps big time. And Google Maps said, don't go on the highway. Don't go on the highway. Take, take the back roads to the airport. So, okay, so we're to, now these back roads in California are the longest neighborhoods that you've ever seen. Six lanes of neighborhood driving. And I kind of thought that driving would be like 35 miles an hour, right? Isn't that neighborhoods? Okay, now granted, I was in, I was in the, the passing lane. 
And next to me was kind of a truck that couldn't really go that much faster. And then a bunch of other cars that were getting on. And I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know the speed limit. I'm in a neighborhood. I thought it would be like 35 miles an hour. And behind me is a California driver. And that California driver honked at me. Now, how many know there's different types of honks? I think there's three basic ones if you know you're driving. Uh, one is the double short honk, which is a beep beep. Can you say it? Yeah, and the beep beep is just kind of like, it's a courtesy honk, isn't it? Yeah. It's a courtesy honk, right? It's just like, hey, I want to pass. Then there's what's called a medium honk. The medium honk is like, beep. Yeah. beep. yeah, and that one is just like, wake up, right? Wake up, you know, you're at a light, you glance, <laughs> you're not in text and drive, but you glance at your phone. You glance, you glance, and it's like, you get this beep. But then there's what, a long honk, right? They're like, beep, like that one right there, right? And that one's like, you're going to die. I get the long honk from the guy behind me, and I'm offended. And so I pull over, this guy goes by me, and like, as he's going by me, he like, when he gets even with me, he stops for a second and looks over, right? Now, my friend, and I'm not going to say who I was with because it, it needs to be anonymous, but Dan is... He's just struggling with this moment. Now, I'm from Tacoma. We like these moments. These are the moments we were made for, right? And so he pulls up, kind of gives that look, kind of like, like, what are you doing? And I gave him the look, kind of like, you know, that I would picture Jesus giving Pharisees when they're sinning. And he blows on by me, okay? He blows on by me. Okay, now here's the thing. This is neighborhoods, right? So there's going to be more stoplights. And we get up, like, it's like at least a mile or two ahead. I'm coming up to a stoplight, and he is at the stoplight, and he's in the middle lane. And I, wanting to be, um, you know, I want to connect. <laughs> I pull over into the far left lane again, the passing lane, and pull up side by side to him so that my friend, we're not saying his name, are we? But it's Dan can be, like, face to face with the guy. And it is like, and can you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, you can, and Dan's just like, what are you doing? I'm just like, we're just here. We're just here. This is where we stopped. I can't, this is, it's a stoplight. It's what we're doing. And there's just like, and there's all of this tension between us and the car. Well, this guy gets out of his car and comes, oh, no, I made that part up. <laughs> but I had to, right? No, okay. Now, what ends up happening is nothing. And he moved on and we got to the airport. But you know, I was thinking about this is, is, you know, how many of us in life feel like all we're doing is going around and honking our horn at people? And when somebody honks at us, we just get upset. Like if you, if you think about cars have horns, horns what if you just had them like on, like on your left arm? And like you're going through life and someone bugs you, you just, ah! you know, you just like, stop. You know, beep, 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 beep. I mean, some of you would just be on the horn all the time. What would families be like? <laughs> Understand, I believe this. We have lost peace. People need peace. Our nation needs peace. I want, did churches go a little bit nuts the last few years with the horn? The, 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 the sign that you've received God's love into your life, like what is the sign? You have peace. Now, as we're driving on, my friend, and I'm not saying his name, but Dan looks at me, and he, he had words for me. He was like, and I, cause I was like, can you believe that guy? And he's like, believe that guy. You were in the passing lane going 35. And so then I'm feeling judged. So the peace that we were lacking with this other car made it into our car. And, um, you know, I just like, doesn't that happen sometimes is you leave your house, you feel like it's going to be a good day. All of this non-peace, all this conflict happens in your life and you go home to your friends or you go home to your roommate or you go home to your family and what happens is this, is the conflict goes into your home. If there is a way to have peace, the kind of peace that can survive the conflict in this world, the kind of peace that could rule, that could, as the Bible says, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, the kind of peace that would actually protect your relationships. Uh, the word peace that's here um, is, um, it's a Greek word, but the people reading it would have had a Jewish or Hebrew understanding of peace. 
And the Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. Can you say shalom? Shalom. shalom. And, and both the Greek and the Hebrew word have a connotation to oneness or harmony. When sin entered this world, when selfishness enters, when Wes gets the horn going on the left arm, what happens is, there's a, there, is a, there is conflict, there's tension that comes into this world. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they sinned, God told them like to the man, you're going to sweat, you're going to toil, there's going to be conflict in your life. It says to the woman, you're going to want to rule over the man, right? But he, you're going to want to control him, but he's going to want to rule over you. Conflict. We have conflict, we have tension, we have struggle, we have all this. A break in harmony with God, with each other, with, with creation. Through Jesus, we have oneness, harmony, shalom. The word shalom has the same root word as another word in Hebrew, and that is a word that means to restore. I would like to suggest tonight three things. One is this, is that peace starts with God, not with us. That we don't make peace with God. God makes peace with us, and we receive it. He made peace for us through Christ. The second thing is this, is that peace is what transforms the troubles in this world. And the third thing is this, is that um, this, this peace of God that he gives us that transforms all the trouble, it actually restores relationships. Verse 2, it says this, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. We confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So this peace came through Jesus. We look forward to it. We look forward to it. And it says this is what? It says we look forward to sharing in what? God's glory. The word glory there, the, the, the Hebrew connotation of glory is that of weight. Um, like if somebody gave you gold, you'd be like, there's substance, there's weight, there's glory. When I held my, 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 my firstborn, Kaylee was born on Father's Day, and I got to hold her in my arms, there was a weight of glory. Um, when you think about glory and weight, it's like there's this object that has so much substance that if it were to hit another substance, that, that substance would be overwhelmed. Peace happens in our lives when we're overwhelmed with God's glory in the midst of all the conflict in this world. Yeah, there's conflict. Look at three and four. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know they help us develop endurance. Endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Um, God's peace transforms our troubles. God's peace shows up. Listen to me, you got, we got to get this down. Some of us think this is that peace is an is a absence of conflict, and that is not true. As long as you live in this world, we're going to have problems. In fact, didn't Jesus promise that? Hey, guys, hey, church, you will be persecuted. And then we're like, we're being persecuted. Why is this happening? Jesus like, I promised it. You will have problems. Why am I having problems? You're going to, you, because you're living on earth. Peace is not a lack of problems. Peace is God's presence in your life in the midst of problems. It, it's in here. It's in, it's, it's not just in the car. It's in your heart. Um, peace. There, there's two things as Americans that we have idolized because we feel a lack of peace. Okay, now I'm going to balance it in a second. So I'm going to say something, you're like, uh, you might turn your head a little bit, but then don't give up on me, okay? Two things that I can look at are signals in my life and in American's life because we worship these two things. And it's a sign that we lack peace. The number one is this, is we actually, we worship vacation and we worship comfort. Now, is God against us having vacations? Literally, God's like, you should have one every week called Sabbath. We neglect that, and so we save them up. I'm saving them all up for one big one, God. And so, and not only that, have you noticed the holy days, the holidays in Scripture were all what? They were like vacations. You guys should take a break and spend time with each other and, right? I mean, have some fun. Build some relate. So God's for all of this. But here's what happens. Because of the lack of conflict in our world, we want to escape. We escape one of two ways. Comfort food 
Anybody here eat their emotions? My emotions taste a lot like Doritos. We, so it, we feel the conflict, so we go to whatever we think brings us comfort. It could be a comfort food. I talked to someone the other day. For them, it's, it's they overdrink alcohol. We overdrink alcohol when what we feel is we have so much pressure, so much problems I want to escape. Um, for some person, their escape might be lust. For someone's escape, it might be workaholism. But you have something that you go to that's your comfort food. You know, like, as a kid, was anything better than when your mom made macaroni and cheese? Like, right? And not the good kind. I'm talking like that it costs like five cents, right? Like, they're like, would you just take this? Um, we worship comfort food. We worship vacation. And so here's an American. We're like, we just like, I'm going to have this vacation. I'm going to go on it. We're looking forward to it. We have all this stuff, you know? And like, I'm thinking we should do this. Like, you gotta understand, I'm going to graduate, I believe, hope, please, pray. And I, I better because I actually booked Disney World for Carrie and I. Celebrating 30 years of marriage, going back to where we did our honeymoon. You don't have to clap. <laughs> for her. I'm for all of this. But you understand, it's like we will go where we don't take any breaks. We don't have peace. And so here's what we think. Comfort food, or we think this amazing vacation. So then we go on the vacation. You ever done this? You go on the vacation, and maybe it was great. I mean, I hope it was great. You come back, and your soul is what? Exhausted. Like you're just, you need a vacation from your vacation. And, and not only that, now you gotta pay for that vacation. Or the next one's gotta be better because that one didn't do it. Can you see why Jesus would say to a culture that was like, think about it, when they were in slavery, when they were in slavery as a people group, all they did is make bricks. Every day you made bricks. Seven days you made bricks. We just, we live in a culture, you're just seven days making bricks. And we're like, oh, if I could just have some macaroni and cheese, if I could have the perfect dream vacation, you know, forget that. I mean, we have these things. And God said, no, you're not gonna live that way. Can you see why Jesus would say now to them, come unto me, all, come to me, all who are weak and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I remember a low point in my life sitting on a, high, uh, on a sidewalk and just hearing, oh, it was a scripture that my grandma buried in my heart, of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me to the side of still waters, he, peace restores relationships. Peace restores your soul. Peace is something the world cannot take from you. And the real peace is the only peace is, it comes from God. God is the only one that can give it to you. It comes through Jesus Christ. And no one in this world can take it away. And no amount of conflict or problems can steal it or rob it from you. It's in here. So we rejoice when we face problems and trials. Anybody you rejoice? Like, this is awesome! I had a bunch of problems today. I wonder what God's going to do. Verse 5, it says, This hope will not disappoint us, for we know how dearly God loved us because He's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. The love we need for the California drivers. Anybody here from California? Yeah. The love we need for you guys. It comes from God, and it's poured out by the Holy Spirit. It says it fills our hearts. Some of your Bible says poured out. It's a refilling. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not saying that you should never have alcohol. It's just saying this is, like, that's not your source. That's not what gives you peace. That's not what's going to give you comfort. That's not what's going to bring you restored relationship. That's not your go-to. You go to Jesus for that. He said, be filled with the Spirit. It's this ongoing process of day by day. I tell you, that what, uh, you might have joy one day, and the next day you're like, what happened to the joy? There's people in this world that will suck it out of you. Do you know one of those joy suckers? <laughs> the Spirit is day by day, we're what? Renewed. We're renewed. Verse 6, oh, listen to this. Just kind of like take this in. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. When we were utterly helpless, when you were at your lowest, God was at his best. His love for you is unconditional. You ever like, 
You know, like, uh, ever have where somebody comes to your house and I don't know what happened, but you just like, maybe your alarm didn't go off or they showed up too early, but you ain't ready. Right? And so you're just like, oh no, you know, just wait, just a second. Right? And you're trying to put it all together. I was interviewing one time for a job and they were going to do it on a phone. And they called and my alarm, I guess, didn't go off or I didn't hear it. And so I pick up the phone and I had not even talked all day. In the middle of the first of introducing myself, my voice cracked. And it was last week. No, it wasn't last week. Um, and, and so, like, you know, we always want to present ourselves as the best. But here it says we are utterly helpless. This isn't us at our best. This is us at our worst. God sees us, knows where we're at. And what does it say? Does he shame us? Does he judge us? Does he... No, what does it say he does? He says he comes and he dies for us. I, I love verse 8, and I um, learned it this way. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, some of your Bibles say yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I mean, this picture of us trying to get to God, make things right, make peace, I got to do better. Some of you, the voice you have of God says to you, do better. I love you, but I'd love you a little bit more if you're a little bit better than mom, a little bit better dad, a little bit better, a little bit better person. If you were a better Christian, I'd love you more. That is not the voice of God. The voice of God is saying, while you were at your lowest, when you were utterly helpless, when you were yet sinners, I was coming for you. I was pursuing you. I was coming with my love for you. Verse 10 says this, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies. You ever thought about that? I'm like, I wasn't His enemy. We were just like, we weren't the best of friends. It's like, no, it just says, we were His enemies. When we were enemies of God, he came to us with friendship. The cross is where God forgives us without lowering his standards. It's where God made peace for us through Jesus Christ. If we were restored by his death, we will certainly be saved by his life. Verse 11. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. There's a few people that were called friends of God. And I don't know what title you're going for in life. I mean, I just like, you're right. But friend of God would be a good one. <laughs> Moses, it was said of Moses that as he would, as he would, as he would go into the tabernacle, as he would go and it would be Joshua would sit there. He would sit there outside and you know, just kind of like he's just apprenticing. He, Moses would go in and he would be there. And it says that he would talk to God face to face as a friend. Like, what's that like? Um, it said about Moses, or Abraham, that Abraham said of him that he was a friend of God. It couldn't have been because he was perfect. Because if you read, I've even re I started reading, I have doing the, you know, the, the, the Bible reading plan we're doing as a church. You start reading it. My, my wife's reading it too. She came to me, she's like, she's upset about Abraham. She's like, this guy's making some bad choices. And I'm like, I'm not trying to defend him. She's like, but you're a guy. And I'm like, that doesn't put me on his team, okay? And we're working through it. But, but you know, um, it's not because he was perfect, but he had faith. Um, it's said of, of Enoch that he walked with God and it was no more. Um, he went to be with God. There's something about the way he walked with God is just, guys, just keep coming. Um, there's something about walking through life together with someone. Carrie and I learned about 10 years in our marriage that for us to connect, we needed to walk. I never wanted to walk. I got a car. I got a license so I didn't have to walk. When she's like, let's go for a walk, I always said, where? She's like, we're just, no, nowhere. We're just, and I'm like, well then, we just, we just do it right here. I learned that um, holding her hand and going shoulder to shoulder were prayers number one in my life with God, and then that's number two. When couples, I'm just talking to the married people here for a second. When couples start to drift, when couples, when there's affairs and adultery, when there's just disconnection and conflict, I tell you, the first thing that went was this. You stopped holding hands. Because the first thing you did. I was uh, 20 years old. I'd wrote a little poem. I was walking with Carrie Lynn Smith. And the whole time, I just like, I wanted to ask her if I could hold her hand. But she's scary. You know, I remember the night, remember what it felt like, 
holding their hand. You know, we went from friends to like, now we're like boyfriend and girlfriend and to like men were married. But after 30 years, I'm finding, oh wait, actually the highest is that we're friends. Jesus says to his disciples, now I call you friends. When we were enemies, God pursued us. This wonderful new relationship we have through Christ. I'll end with this and then we'll have a moment of worship. Um, anybody, who's got, anybody got pets? Yeah. Pets? Anybody, who's got dogs? Where are my dog people? Dog people? Okay. Great. And then cat people, where are you at? I want to see who needs to get saved still. Okay. <laughs> Just, kids. Uh, we, we've got both in our house. We've got both in our house. All the kids are gone and the pets are there. So we got a dog and we got a cat and they're different. I don't know if this is true of every dog and cat, but our dog is just kind of like, you know, really wants you to like them. They're just like, do you like me? Do you like me? Would you like me? And the cat's kind of like, whatever. <laughs> you know, and, and they're very really interesting is if you feed a dog, if you feed a dog, the, dog's, the dog thinks this, you fed me, you must be my master, right? You cared for me, you provided for me. The cat, you feed a cat, the cat's like, I'm the master. It's what you do. Go get me some more food. I wonder if the American church has had cat theology. We need dog theology. We thought we were in charge. And the sign of it is we now, we have all this turmoil, all this tension, all this conflict. And like, where do we get it? And we just think, oh, you know what? If I have the right vacation... If we just go on this one, this is the one. This is the one. If we just have this one. <clears throat> During COVID, people left their jobs, then they left their relationships. Somewhere in there, they left their churches. Well, I get it. We didn't like how we felt. But there's nothing in this world that's going to give you the peace that you need. This peace only comes from Jesus Christ. Therefore, since we have been made right, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have peace with God. We have peace with God because of what He's done for us. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to start and just ask, like, who's been just like, honestly, your world has been bumpy. It has been tense. There's been conflict. And tonight, you just like to raise your hand and receive the peace of God for your family, for your marriage, for your life. Raise, raise your hand. Say that's me tonight, all over the place, a bunch of us. I need a peace. I need a peace. Beautiful. Go ahead and put your hand down. Is there someone here who would say, I need to receive Christ today and say yes and invite God into my life. Be my Lord, my Savior. Give my life to Him. When you were born, God knew this day was going to come and it's tonight. Would you lift your hand up and say, yes, it's me. I want to receive Christ tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Beautiful. Go ahead and put your hand down. Would you stand with me and will you say a prayer? See a victory. You're gonna see a victory.